I really hope this is the last episode that wastes time setting things up, because 90% of these first three episodes has been morons wandering around convoluted setups for future events. Buckle up, because we're going to bounce around Arda like a pinball machine. First things first, we head to the Southlands to follow Isildur's horse, Beric. And just so you know who this horse is, we get a flashback of when Elendil set him free. You know Elendil, the super dedicated father who would do anything to protect Isildur above all else that abandoned him and didn't even try looking for his son. Yeah, that father of the year. So apparently Beric's been wandering around Mordor for some time, even killing a few orcs in the process, before his quest marker leads him straight to Isildur, who was not under a pile of burning debris like we last saw. He's not a burnt husk to extract bone meal from, nor was he grabbed up by orcs to be put on the menu later. No, somehow, with no explanation, Isildur is now trapped in a spider cave. How is he even alive? Dude should be a Slurpee right now. I get that he can't die because he's a Sealdor, but come on, he isn't even affected by some sort of venom. Anyway, Beric waltzes in and wakes up Isildur, who breaks free using the dagger of an orc across from him. The orc wakes up and attacks, but in the struggle, a big spider jumps the orc and bites his head, which causes it to explode. Again, I will ask, how is Isildur alive? Anyway, there are more spiders in this cave than Aragog's lair, so everyone should be deader than half the cast of eight-legged freaks, but since it's a Isildur and his horse, none of the spiders bite either of the two, and they escape making their way to Pelergear. Later, Isildur loots a body for the sword and boots, even though he's got a pair of boots, then they stumble across a cart surrounded by bodies. When inspecting the cart, he's stabbed in the leg by a woman named Estrid. Why did she stab this obvious human? Because she thought he was an orc. Yeah, Ray Charles could have seen that difference, but sure. Anyway, Estrid binds the wound, and the two continue towards the coast when they cross another ravaged cart. Isildur inspects the dude, who turns out to be another one of Adar's devotees, and a bunch more jump Isildur and Estrid. Then, from in the tree not 30 feet away, Erendir, the fresh prince of Noldor, comes firing arrows, jumping out of the tree, and then does a corkscrew kick straight out of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie through the cart. Why through the cart? Not a clue, he's probably cartist but he does strike down the followers that were left behind, while a few others make off with Beric. Then Erendir tells Isildur he has business in Pelergear, picks up a bundle of sticks, and held to- Hold on a second! Why is this bundle here when you were in the tree over there? You mean to tell me you collected all this wood, saw the trap laid out for travelers, then snuck around just to hide in that tree to do your stupid kick? Really? And none of the followers heard or saw you? Fuck! Anyway, that night we jump into town where a funeral is being held. For who? It couldn't possibly be somebody of importance- It's Bronwyn?! Holy shit! Consequences for actions were upheld?! I'm stunned! Has hell frozen over? Is this yet another of Christ's miracles? Wait, 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 wait. Let, let me check this. I don't trust this. Ah, there it is. Na Naz- Naz, uh, this bitch left rings of power to advocate for women's freedom and equality in Iran. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Anyway, Theo blames Aaron Deer for her death because we don't have enough petty drama in this shit show, and he never wants to see Chicken Legolas again because Iluvatar forbid we blame the orcs that killed and attacked everyone. The next day, Theo tells Isildur he knows where the horse is. How would he know this? Not a clue, and he wants to meet with Isildur at night which gives him and Estrid time to connect. Then, Estrid burns the brand on her neck just after the two sons, abandoned by their parents, sneak into the camp to retrieve Beric, when suddenly people are attacked and pulled up into the trees. Isildur rides off, and Theo is taken, calling for help. Next, let's stay in the southern region and briefly head to Mordor, where Adar assures one of his followers that Sauron is dead and will not come back. And then possibly the most disgusting disrespect of Tolkien's work. The orc walks over to his loving wife and embraces their child, because now orcs only want to be left alone to have families. What, what the, the fuck? fuck? This is absolutely infuriating, revealing the utter contempt for Tolkien's beliefs, views, and story. The orcs were elves corrupted and twisted by Morgoth's machinations into macabre creatures of shadow, caring only for themselves that delight in the pain and suffering of others. They'd sooner eat each other than start up an LLC for orcs' rights activism. Do you understand how fucked this is? This is like those retarded freaks at TED Talks trying to convince us that pedophilia should be accepted as a legitimate sexual 
sexuality. Fuck J.D. Payne, Patrick McKay, and every other piece of corn in this defecation on the professor and his legacy. Anyway, a hill troll walks into the encampment looking for Sauron and tosses down the head of an orc sent to retrieve him from Adar, who doesn't look like he actually cares about the death of his so-called children. Now we head back to Eregion to deal with both dwarves and elves together, as Disa and Durin IV have come to meet with Celebrimbor and hear what he has to offer. Celebrimbor tries to convince them that magical rings will fix their problems. How does Celebrimbor know what issues plague the dwarves in Khazad-dûm? Why does he believe a material object with limited magical powers would be able to solve the problems they face with the mountain's collapse? Well, because the script said so, and trying to get answers out of anyone, including the writers, would be like pulling teeth from Smaug. Anyway, Durin refuses because he and his dad haven't kissed and made up yet, so Anatar steps in trying to butter him up, but that doesn't work either. The couple leaves and Lizzo threatens to tattletale unless dipshit here gives the offer to his father. Meanwhile, Sauron and his wig continue pushing Celebrimbor to make the ring sooner, claiming that High King Doublechin has banned the forging of more. So Celebrimbor decides to write a strongly worded letter to stall long enough to make the rings Sauron wants. Over in Casa Doom, Narvi speaks with the king because the merchants want access to the grain reserves. Then the king asks for them to come in, and in walks Dimwit. Did, did the king not just ask for the merchants? Whatever, Durin gives Durin Celebrimbor's proposal, apologizes, and tells him he has reservations about this offer. Then, back in Eregion, Durin Durin and Nega Durin have arrived with Mithril, which Anatar then adds to the liquid metal to make more rings. Finally, we return to Numenor, where a funeral is held for both the king and those who died at the retarded request of an insane elf. Queen Regent Diversity Hire walks around without a single person to guide her, because this show couldn't even attempt to portray a newly blind person well. Then a disgruntled mother tells Queen Latifah her favorite movie is Jaws before slapping her in front of Elendil as well. Dude ran through a hail of fire and brimstone to find her after abandoning his son, and he just watches this happen. Dude's as blind as she is. So, the woman is forgiven, and after the funeral, Karl Marx goes up to her chambers and talks with Muriel about who should and how to rule Numenor moving forward. He makes numerous advances towards her, and she refuses to give up her position, saying she wants the white dress with the eagle on it because it was her father's symbol. Marx disagrees because he wants the red dress, and says that unless an eagle shows up, few people would even trust her anyway. The next day, Karl Marx, Tits, and Prince Edward over here go to the pub with another politician and openly discuss treason. They're not even trying to hide anything. I feel like I'm watching a James O'Keefe expose. Anyway, Earin makes an absolute heel turn as a surprise villain like she's Hans from Frozen and reveals she not only knows about but stole the Palantir. How did you- Where did you put it? God, either your first kid is gonna fall out or you're Wonder Woman. Anyway, later at Queen Letitia's coronation, she's about to take up the dildo of Numenor when people in the crowd accuse her of lies. Whitney Houston then acknowledges her mistakes, promising to do better when Iarin reveals the Palantir she's been using for Kegel exercises. She tosses it down, and when Elendil touches it, he's blown back, which turns the crowd against Muriel. Just then, a wild pigeon appears, the auspicious omen Farazan feared. So while it stands there in front of the crowd of turkeys with their mouths agape, the politician remembers his favorite movie is A Knight's Tale and starts a chant in favor of Marx, who approaches the flying type and uses the symbolism to rally the people in his favor. And since its moveset consists of agility, feather dance, roost, and tailwind, it doesn't do shit and fucks off after making everything worse. All right. Of all the episodes thus far, if there was ever proof the writers, producers, the people attached to this project who agree with the decisions made, and the woke tards that support this crap have absolutely no understanding of Tolkien, it's this episode. The primary reasoning being the orcs, of course. Adar is the Sindarin word for father, after all, so the foundation for this choice was laid way back when he was first introduced. And yet they can't even figure out how to make the orcs relatable except give them families that Uru 
Farouk would most reasonably never have. And all of this is born of the popular and retarded idea that morality is subjective. Has anyone else noticed how many villains have been given the I was misunderstood treatment? Sticking to modern storytelling only, Dracula, Maleficent, Killmonger, Thanos, and now Orcs and Sauron are only a handful of examples used to blur the lines nowadays because bad writers will tell you that's the only way to make compelling villains. Weird, because the most compelling villains I could think of as I write this script are Cell, Frieza, Griffith, Gollum, Saruman, and Sauron. Half are converts, the rest are flat negative characters, and all of them are compelling. Gosh, it's almost like their mainstream staying power is felt decades later, while most of the sympathetic examples I gave were forgotten faster than Democratic constituents. The one thing they do, being evil, they do incredibly well. They are selfish, destructive, and will sacrifice anyone and everyone to achieve their goals, no matter how simple, ill-defined, and grandiose as it may be. We don't need to have all their backstories, where they came from, who their parents are, what drove them to commit the actions they do, and how they want their steak cooked. Trying to understand Sauron's psychology is different from learning more about the Xenomorph's lifestyle. Some things or people have just been influenced, manipulated, and corrupted in such a way that they are just evil. Orcs are evil because of an undefined amount of torture and abuse they suffered at the hands of Melkor. This is reflected in their actions when they murder, pillage, and devour the various peoples of Middle-earth, and every argument against what I said is disproven by the simple fact that the orcs didn't pick up and leave. And that strikes at the core of the problem, because everything going on here is artificial. The tension between Elrond and Galadriel, the blame on both Durins by the other dwarves, Theo never wanting anything to do with the Fresh Prince ever again. All of it is inorganic with no rhyme or reason to occur, as all of these characters should know better. Galadriel would sooner erase every mention of Sauron from existence like Big Brother correcting wrong think, but no, sure, let's throw that character detail out the window and have her use a ring influenced by the very entity she swore to destroy. Theo knows full well that Baby Mama and Chicken Legolas fought side by side to save him and everyone in Pelergear, but sure, give him the cold shoulder like my high school crush. The orcs never would have stood against Sauron, nor attacked him because of how much he should be feared. Instead, he's killed, turned into an Italian's worst nightmare, and now that we're watching him suffer, there is an invocation of sympathy for one of the stand-ins for the devil! I mean, he was even given an uplifting musical sting when he surfaced in episode one! And no matter how much this show desperately tries to make a side with any of these evil forces, it can never work because the outcome must remain the same. Sauron will rule Mordor, the orcs will serve him, and every life they extinguish, every home raised and atrocity committed will automatically counter any artificial attempt to get us to sympathize with evil. This is because evil cannot create, it can only corrupt just like The Rings of Power is a corruption of Tolkien's works. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.